So the end of Beowulf, um, chapter 39 and, and moving forward. Um, Beowulf has just died. His soul has left his flesh and gone to glory. We have this overlay of Thor and Jesus and uh, this lesson about how you're supposed to face death as an Anglo-Saxon. I mean, we have these progressions that have continued to come throughout the story. Uh, some complicated stuff going on. Of course, our hero is dead, leaving behind Wiglaf um, as a character to sort of carry the rest of the story. Uh, so let's see what Wiglaf does, and let's see how the author ties this whole thing up. We're on chapter 39. They're all like these short little chapters, and I think there's 42 in the whole story. So we're, we're pretty close to the end, and I'll just try and record it out here with, with some thoughts. Um, chapter 39. And then Wiglaf was left, a young warrior, sadly watching his beloved king, seeing him stretched on the ground, left guarding a torn and bloody corpse. But Beowulf's killer was dead, too, the coiled dragon cut in half, cold and motionless. Men and their swords had swept it from the earth, left it lying in front of its tower, won its treasure when it fell, crashing to the ground, cut it apart with their hammered blades, driven them deep in its belly. It would never fly through the night, glowing in the sky, glorying in its riches, burning and raiding. Now, if this is all allegorical, this is some pretty cool stuff. Men and their swords, if swords are faith, it's interesting that this they, they've swept death from the earth, right? Um won the treasure that came after death uh, with their hammered blades. Uh, it's cool stuff. You know, it never would have treasure again. Nobody's going to bury people with giant piles of treasure ever again. Like, this works allegorically if that's what the author's trying to get at. Uh, Glorying in its riches, burning and raiding, two warriors had shown it their strength, slain it with their swords. Not many men, no matter how strong, no matter how daring. How bold had done as well, rushing at its venomous fangs, or even quietly entering its earth mound, intending to steal, but finding the treasure's guardian awake, watching and ready to greet them. Beowulf had gotten its gold, bought it with blood. Dragon and king had ended each other's days forever. And when the battle was over, Beowulf's followers came out of the wood, cowards and traitors, knowing the dragon was dead. Afraid while it spit its fires to fight in their lord's defense, to throw their javelins and spears, they came like shame-faced jackals. Nice simile there. Uh, spears, sorry. Their shields in their hands to the place where the prince lay dead and waited for Wiglaf to speak. He was sitting near Beowulf's body, wearily sprinkling water in the dead man's face, trying to stir him. He could not. No one could have kept life in their lord's body or turned aside the lord's will. World and men all move as he orders, and always have, and always will. Then Wiglaf turned and angrily told them what men without courage must hear. Wexton's brave son stared at the traitors, his heart sorrowful, and said what he had to. In fact, uh, one of the things I like about this story, and that I think you're starting to see right here, is that it's, it's almost a mini recap with Wiglaf at the end. Um, you know, Wiglaf stands on top of that cliff, a young man looking down, trying to decide what to do, and he has an internal struggle between courage and fear. He's got to decide whether to do the right thing and help Beowulf or run away. Ultimately, he decides courage, uh, and he goes down and he faces the dragon. Well, while he's facing the dragon, his, his uncle, his king, Beowulf, dies, and now he has to go through loss, and he's facing despair at the loss of Beowulf, and so he has to get revenge. Who's he going to get revenge on? These guys who came down and, and caused this problem. So this is what Wiglaf has to say to these people who betrayed um, his lord. I say what anyone who speaks the truth must say. Your lord gave you gifts, swords, and armor you stand in now. You sat on the meat hall benches, prince and followers, and he gave you with open hands helmets, mail shirts, hunted across the world for the best of weapons. War came and you ran like cowards, dropped your swords as soon as the danger was real. Should Beowulf have boasted of your help, rejoiced in your royal strength with... God's good grace, he helped himself, swung his sword alone, won his own revenge. The help I gave him was nothing but all I was able to give. I went to him, knowing that nothing but Beowulf's strength could save us, and my sword was lucky, found some vital place, and bled away the burn lanes. Too few of his warriors remembered to come when our Lord faced death alone, and now the giving of swords, of golden rings and riches and estates is over. 
ended for you and everyone who shares your blood. When the brave Geats hear how you bolted and ran, none of your race will have anything left but their lives, and death would be better for them and for you than the kind of life you can lead branded with disgrace. So Beowulf exiles these guys, uh, and they deserve it, right? This is poetic justice. They ran away. They didn't defend Beowulf uh, while he was dying, and so they deserve to be exiled. Uh, of course, this is going to skip a bunch of chapters, and I just I just want to recap the chapters and what you missed. This is a problem, and this is where we get close to events of historical importance. Remember, we talked about the definition of a heroic epic, and it was either a fight between good and evil, which this is, or events of historical importance. The events of historical importance don't happen here, but they're hinted at. Um, Wiglaf exiles these guys. Remember, these are the 12 greatest warriors in Geatland, um, the ones Beowulf picked to go with him. They're exiled. Where do you figure they're going to go? There's really only one logical option, Sweden, right? Uh, Geatland accepted Swedish exiles, uh, and so Sweden will probably accept the Geatish exiles. And when it does, what's it going to find out? Well, it's going to find out that half of Geatland burned down because of a dragon attack. Uh, it's going to find out that Beowulf's dead and this new guy named Wiglaf is king. Uh, and that there's a giant dragon treasure. When you put all those things together, what's going to happen? Well, Sweden's going to come and invade Geatland. And this actually happens historically. There's no dragon treasure, but Geatland gets wiped out by Sweden. And Gotland is now a, you know, it's a it's a city in lower so southern Sweden. So, um, you know, this is the historically significant events. Also, this ties in the third theme. Wiglaf is staring at his death. He's going to die defending Geatland, um, you know, against the Swedes, the overwhelming army of the Swedes that he can't hope to defeat. And you know what? It probably would have been smart for him not to exile the 12, 12 greatest warriors, um, but he did what was right, not you know, what was smart. And, you know, I guess he's going to pay for that. Uh, so what happens in the chapters you miss uh, between 38 and 42? Um, Wiglaf sends a rider to the village at Geatland to get some people to come help um, bury Beowulf's body and build that tower he was talking about um, as he died. And so they come, uh, but the, the messenger then tells the whole history of the story of Geatland, almost like, you know, Geatland's going to vanish. And he talks about the fights with the Swedes and, and all of this background information. It's completely unessential. Uh, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go over it, but he tells the history of Geatland. And then he, he says, we can expect war with the Swedes. Uh, get ready for it. Let's go bury Beowulf. And so then they come and, and they bury Beowulf. Um, so let's finish this out. Hiding that treasure deep in its Earth Mound, as the dragon had done, broke God's law and brought it no good. Guarding its stolen wealth, it killed Wiglaf's king, but was punished with death. Who knows when princes and their soldiers, the bravest and strongest of men, are destined to die. Their time ended, their homes, their halls, empty and still. So Beowulf sought out the dragon, dared it into battle, but could never know what God had decreed or that death would come to him or why. So the spell was solemnly laid by men long dead. It was meant to last till the day of judgment. Whoever stole their jewels, their gold, would be cursed with the flames of hell, heaped high with sin and guilt, if greed was what brought him. God alone could break their magic, open his grace to man. Then Wiglaf spoke, Wexton's son. How often an entire country suffers on one man's account? That time has come to us. We tried to counsel our beloved king, our shield of protection, show him danger, urge him to leave the dragon in the dark earth mound that had lain in so long, live there till the end of the world. Fate and his will were too strong. Everyone knows the treasure his life bought. But Beowulf was worth more than this gold, than this, and this gift is a harsh one. I've seen it all, been in the tower, the earth mound, where the jewels and the armor were hidden, allowed to behold them once war and its terror were done. I gathered them up, gold and silver, filled my arms as full as I could, and quickly carried them back to my king. He lay right here, still alive still sure in mind and tongue, he spoke sadly, said I should greet you, asked that after you burned his body, you bring his ashes here. Make this the tallest of towers and his tomb, as great and lasting as his fame, when Beowulf himself walked the earth and no man living could match him. Come, let us enter the tower. See the dragon's marvelous treasure one last time. I'll lead the way. Take you close to the heap of curious jewels and rings and gold. Let the pyre be ready and high. As soon as we've seen the dragon's hoard, we will carry our beloved king, our leader and lord, where he'll fly forever in God's keeping. Then Wiglaf commanded the wealthiest Geats, brave warriors and owners of land, leaders of his people, to bring wood for Beowulf's funeral. Now, when the fire 
The fire must feed on his body. Flames grow heavy and black with him who endured arrows falling in iron showers, feathered shafts, barbed and sharp, shot through the linden shield, storms of eager arrowheads dropping. And Wexton's wise son took seven of the noblest geats, led them together down the tunnel, deep into the dragon's tower. The one in front had a torch held high in his hands. The best of Beowulf's followers entered behind that gleaming flame, seeing gold and silver rotting on the ground with no one to guard it. The geats were not troubled with scruples or fears, but quickly gathered up treasure and carried it out of the tower. And they rolled the dragon down to the cliff and dropped it over. Let the ocean take it, the tides sweep it away. Then silver and gold and precious jewels were put on a wagon and Beowulf's body and brought down to the jutting sand where the pyre waited. This is a nice bookend, too, because we started with the, the death and burial of Schild, an ancient king of the Danes, and now we're going to end with the uh, burning of Beowulf. Uh, this is, I think, another connection, though. The, the treasure, he says, in this tower is protected. Um, anybody who seeks the treasure out of greed is going to burn in hell. Only people who go into the into the treasure room not wanting the treasure for itself and people who are good, the, the best, the purest of the geats are allowed to touch the treasure. So if the treasure represents heaven, the idea here is you can't get heaven by being greedy. You can't get heaven by wanting it. You have to get it through through not wanting it, through actions. Um, you can't wish to get into heaven and, and greedily grab at it. You know, like that's an interesting metaphor if that's what the treasure represents. Anyway, we're going we're gonna to have Beowulf's funeral here, the last little chapter of the story. A huge heap of wood was ready, hung around with helmets and battle shields and shining mail shirts, all as Beowulf had asked. The bearers brought... Why does this happen? At least it's the last time it's going to happen. Um, the bearers brought their beloved lord, their glorious king, and weeping laid him high on the wood. Then the warriors began to kindle that greatest of funeral fires. Smoke rose above the flames, black and thick, and while the wind blew and the fire roared, they wept. And Beowulf's body crumbled and was gone. The Geats stayed, moaning their sorrow, lamenting their lord. A gnarled old woman, hair wound tight and gray on her head, groaned a song of misery, of infinite sadness and days of mourning, of fear and sorrow to come, slaughter and terror and captivity, and heaven swallowed the billowing smoke. This is a weird addition right here at the end of the story. This is a pagan burial ritual. Um, this woman is what's called a volupsa, or a, a you know, a a witch. Uh, and these were classic, I mean, they were, they were sort of um, formed after those three weirds, the three fates. And she, she sings a song. The song is the Volupsa. It's a song that the story of Ragnarok is in. And clearly this is a reference to Ragnarok. Look at it. Um, days of mourning, of fear and sorrow, slaughter and terror and captivity. I mean, this is, this is a pagan burning of Beowulf's corpse, even though he was said to be, you know, Christian. So anyway, then the Geats built the tower as Beowulf had asked, strong and tall, so sailors could find it from far and wide. Working for ten long days, they made his monument, sealed his ashes and walls as straight and high as wise and willing hands could raise them. And the riches he and Wiglaf had won from the dragon, rings, necklaces, ancient hammered armor, all the treasures they'd taken were left there too, silver and jewels buried in the sandy ground, back in the earth again, and forever hidden and useless to men. And then 12 of the bravest Geats rode their horses around the tower, telling their sorrow, telling stories of their dead king and his greatness, his glory, praising him for heroic deeds, for a life as noble as his name. So should all men raise up words for their lords, warm with love when their shield and protector leaves his body behind, sends his soul on high. And so Beowulf's followers rode, mourning their beloved leader, crying that no better king had ever lived, no prince so mild, no man so open to his people, so deserving of praise. The end. So at the end, 12 guys ride around Beowulf's tomb singing songs of his life. Disciples. Is this Anglo-Saxon Jesus again? I, I think it is. Some people have gone so far as to suggest that this tower might be metaphorical of the Bible. Um, it's got the treasure locked inside it. Uh, and it's, it's you know, got the story of Beowulf um, slash Jesus inside it. Like, there's, there's ways to go with this. So there's lots of, like, allegorical things, maybe enough to melt your brain, um, going on in these last chapters. And they all overlap and overlay each other in this really uh, strong and powerful way. Um, I've got about four more minutes before I have to go do something else, so I'm going to try and, and bring this to a close um, in a meaningful way for you. Uh, I do want to talk about Wiglaf really quickly. Uh, I asked you that question last time, who's more brave, Beowulf or Wiglaf? There were a lot of great answers. Um, 
But what it all comes down to is your definition of bravery. If bravery is doing something that scares you, then Beowulf was never brave. Beowulf was fearless. He never knew fear. Wiglaf, on the other hand, was brave. He was scared of the dragon. He was miserable looking down at it. He didn't have any superpowers. He didn't have any experience. He didn't know what he was doing. He had no reason to expect he would survive a dragon encounter, and he went down and fought that dragon encounter anyway. And I think this is one of the points of the story. This story is about Beowulf. It's called Beowulf. Beowulf is the main character, but to my mind, Wiglaf is maybe a more important character. Wiglaf is a character that we call the everyman. There's one of these in every story. He represents you, the reader. He's not special. He doesn't have superpowers. And yet he goes and fights the dragon. Not only does he go and fight the dragon, he makes the difference fighting the dragon. He's the one that enables Beowulf to be victorious and slay the dragon. Without him, the dragon wins and Beowulf's dead. And the dragon lives. So this regular human being who has no superpowers does what's right, does what he knows he has to do, and it makes all the difference. You know, on some level, that's, that's, he's, he's more brave than Beowulf because he doesn't have those abilities, and he is us. And so at the end of the day, what is the poet saying? Like, we have to do the right thing. We have to know what's right and follow through with it. And, and you can never be Beowulf. You can never be as big as Beowulf, as strong as Beowulf, as brave as Beowulf. You can't. It's impossible. But you can be Wiglaf. And making that choice can make all the difference in the world, even if you don't feel that it can. I mean, there's there's some great, strong symbolism here at the end of the story with the handoff from Beowulf to Wiglaf. We're not epic heroes. We're not the heroes of myth and legend and song. Those are ideals. Ideals can never be achieved. They can only be looked up to. And you can emulate them. You can try and be like Beowulf. You're going to fail. But you'll be a better person for having tried. And that's what the story is getting at at the end. And that's why Wiglaf's here, to be you, listening to the story, thinking about what Beowulf did and how he did it and why he did it, and then following his example as best you are able. I mean, that's, that's some empowering stuff. You can't be Beowulf. You can be Wiglaf. It's a good place to end it. Um, you know, I look forward to the lit reactions. Thanks.